Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. We left Jesus in our last lesson in the home of Caiaphas, the Jewish high priest. The Sanhedrin council had been called to the high priest's house to try Jesus for being a false prophet. We also left Peter warming himself by a fire in the courtyard of Caiaphas' home. Unfortunately, we watched him deny Jesus three times. When the rooster crowed, the truth of what he had just done came bursting into his conscience, and at that moment, Jesus turned and looked directly at him. We didn't have time to get into Peter's response to the revelation of his denying Jesus three times, but we will pick up at that point, which is found in verse 62, where we are told, and he went outside and wept bitterly. I imagine that most of my listeners know what it is to deny Jesus in some way, whether through sin, disobedience, or being ashamed to be known as a follower of Jesus. And since you are listening to this podcast, I would imagine that you have had your time of grieving over the sin and pride that you acted out. But have you ever felt conviction so deep that you wept bitterly over your sin like Peter did? Or have you grieved as deeply as Peter when you saw your cowardice and love of self after denying the Lord and your heart was torn to pieces over it? We can have worldly sorrow over sin and how we have hurt others, but worldly sorrow always falls short of genuine repentance that brings about a radical change of life. Judas Iscariot had worldly sorrow, not godly sorrow. He was sorry over betraying Jesus. Sorry that he was beaten, scourged, and crucified because of his treachery, and maybe even sorry that so many people were terribly hurt over his wicked deed and what it produced. But his sorrow was selfish and filled with self pity. He didn't mourn over his sin, otherwise, he would have repented instead of hanging himself. His suicide was an expression of worldly sorrow that leaves people without hope because it doesn't have the power to transform their lives. Those in the grip of worldly sorrow don't see any hope of change. They feel trapped, and they are trapped, because they refuse to go to Jesus for forgiveness and deliverance. This leaves people with the consuming emotions and thoughts of hopelessness that leads to suicide, which is an utterly selfish act. Peter didn't follow the way Judas took. The agony of his mind, heart, and soul was intense. It lasted for three miserable days. He was a coward and had betrayed Jesus, first by abandoning him when he was arrested and then denying he even knew him. Why did he do this? Because he loved himself more than Jesus, so he sought to save his life through his denial of the Savior. Though his grief was fierce and must have seemed like it would never end, he was taking the path of godly sorrow, where he was repenting of his sin and wanting the power to change. He was forced to endure that agonizing condition until Christ's resurrection broke the power of darkness that was trying to destroy the grieving man. Through Christ, Peter's excruciating grief gave way to receiving by faith the Lord's forgiveness and salvation. He could never forget his betrayal of Jesus, nor could he forget the forgiveness and acceptance he received from the one he had abandoned and denied. The story ended well with Peter. But with Judas, it ended in eternal agony in hell. What a tragedy that didn't have to be. If he would have taken the path of repentance instead of that of self-pity and worldly sorrow, his story would have ended differently and the prophecies about him would have been different as well. Returning to Jesus who was being held in the high priest's home, we begin to see the heartless abuse that was committed against him in verses 63 through 65. The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, Prophesy, who hit you? And they said many other insulting things to him. When you read the stories about the persecuted church, it's shocking how demonic people can act in beating and torturing Christ's followers. It seems like there's no depth of evil that they aren't willing to go when driven by the insane hatred of demons to abuse those who belong to Jesus. If people have hated and abused God's people, it's because they first hated the Savior. What his people faced, he faced first. The hatred his people received is ultimately hatred that's expressed towards him. 
What's done to the Savior's people is done to him, and the Lord takes this very personally. Yet Jesus is compassionate even towards those that persecuted him and his people. He endures their hatred against him and his children to give the persecutors a chance to see the life and love of Christ so that they may repent. For those persecutors who refuse to repent, they will answer for their abuse of Christ's children, and that will be very serious. The men guarding Jesus would have been temple guards, and these more than likely were Levites. They were religious men whose responsibility it was to protect the temple. Yet now there was the one who is greater than the temple, the one whom the temple worship was supposed to be directed towards, and they were beating and mocking him. What they were doing to Jesus, they were doing to the Father, and their rejection and abuse of Messiah would bring about the destruction of the temple since it ceased to be a house of worship for the one true God. With what was taking place in abusing Jesus in the high priest's home, we know is only the beginning of our Lord's suffering. Think of the horrid abuses, injuries, and indignities which the holy and innocent Jesus endured for us. Think about how those cruel religious officers spit in his face, blindfolded him, and then struck him again and again while mocking and deriding him. Should we not be willing to suffer shame and abuse for him who loved us so purely and truly? Should we not be willing to suffer persecution for his sake who gave himself so freely for our salvation? And what about the cost of true discipleship? Should we not be willing to pay any price the Lord would ask of us so that we might live pleasing to him and bring glory to his name? Our compromise in the face of all that Jesus did for us is reprehensible. Yet people do it all the time, claiming they are free in Christ, and this is only excuse for their being friends with the world and practicing sin. As the Moravians coined the term, Jesus deserves the reward of his suffering. But how many that claim Christ as their Savior give him what he deserves, which is their wholehearted, absolute devotion to him? Moving on to verse 66, we are told, at daybreak, the council of elders of the people, both the chief priests and teachers of the law, met together, and Jesus was led before them. Why did the Sanhedrin council meet at daybreak, which is a most inopportune time? They had Jesus arrested in secret and was going to try him in secret so as to not draw any attention to themselves and incur the animosity of the populace or be the cause of starting a riot. According to Roman law, the council didn't have any power or authority to try criminals. They could debate over religious matters, but their conquerors didn't allow them to beat and execute people. The Sanhedrin had its beginning under Moses, which consisted of 70 men that were upright and honorable in character, and they were to help Moses govern the people. Under the direction of the Lord, as is written in Numbers chapter 11, these men were to judge the people impartially for God. Yet we see that the Sanhedrin had become a monstrosity of religious pride and perversion, to such an extent that they were going to orchestrate the murder of their promised Messiah. The high priest was the chief justice of this corrupt court and sham trial. It may be that the elders of Israel met in their council chambers and there tried Jesus when the sun was rising. Another reason why they wanted to try Jesus at daybreak was to have him executed before Passover began which began at sunset that day. This means that Jesus would have to be dead and buried before the sun set, which was the beginning of a new day according to Judaism. The Mosaic law declared that the Lord would curse the land if the executed weren't buried before sunset. Then we read in verses 67 through 69, If you're the Christ, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, If I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I asked you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. We are only given a synopsis of all that was said during this illegal trial. The other gospel accounts present some various points that Dr. Luke didn't mention. The corruption of the Sanhedrin was so great, they had set up false testimony to condemn Jesus. How ironic! They were trying to defend the God of all truth with lies and deception. And even with all their lies, they couldn't agree among themselves what Jesus did that deserved the penalty of death. 
The heartlessness and hatred of these elders of Israel was so great that they said nothing about the beatings the temple guards inflicted upon Jesus. After the false witnesses gave their lying testimonies, the questioning grew very intense and direct. They demanded that Jesus answer their question, If you are the Christ, tell us. Jesus was the Messiah, and he testified to this fact, as we will shortly see. Yet they refused to believe what the Lord taught during his ministry years or to accept the evidence from all the miracles he performed. Jesus was silent before his accusers because they wouldn't listen to anything he said, for their hearts were corrupt and reprobate. After they demanded an answer from Jesus, he responded with a bold declaration of his divinity. The first thing he said, If I tell you, you will not believe me. How hypocritical! Central to the Jewish faith was the belief in Messiah, yet their unbelief was so great that there was no room for Messiah to show himself to them. They had put themselves in a very small religious box that was tightly sealed to prevent any divine intervention. They had become the epitome of the valley of very dry bones that Ezekiel prophesied about. What a sad and tragic religion that claims to hold to the truth, yet makes no room for God. They wanted God's blessings, but they didn't want God or His intervention into their lives that would upset their dead religion. The Lord's statement, If I tell you, you will not believe me, is a veiled yes to their question if He was the promised Messiah. No matter how Jesus answered their questions, they wanted to kill Him, and they were going to find a way. In verse 68, Jesus went on to state, And if I asked you, you would not answer. Jesus turned the table on them by stating that if he asked them a question, if he was the Messiah, they wouldn't answer because they wouldn't want to incriminate themselves one way or another. Then Jesus upset the whole bunch of hypocrites by stating in verse 69, But from now on the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. This was certainly a direct claim that he was the Messiah and that he was equal with the Father, that he was God. In Mark chapter 14, verse 62, we are given our Lord's reply where Jesus clearly admits, I am. He went on to say, And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Mark adds the point where Jesus proclaims his second coming to be as true a fact as his first coming. When he returns, he will come down on the clouds of heaven, which is a picture of might and power. He stood before them as the meek and lowly Jesus, but when he returns, it will be in the power and glory and majesty of who he is as God Almighty. The warning to these men is clear. Be careful how you treat me, because you will give an answer, and have to face your Messiah when you behold him in power, either at the judgment or his second coming. These men had no fear of God, so they didn't fear God incarnate. And since they were blinded by self-righteousness, they couldn't see the horrendous evil they were committing or the hypocrisy that defined their life and religion. In verse 70, they all asked, Are you then the Son of God? He replied, You are right in saying I am. All the false witnesses failed at incriminating Jesus, so the leaders went in attack mode. These religious rulers wanted Jesus to declare with such plain words who he was so as to incriminate himself. They wanted to justify their hatred of him and their efforts to kill him, and the only way they could condemn a man who was so thoroughly righteous was to find some way to make him appear as a criminal. In Matthew's account, we are told in Matthew chapter 26, verse 63, But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. When the accusations were frivolous, Jesus remained silent. But now that the high priest called Jesus under oath to God to answer his question, the Lord clearly and boldly responded. It appears that the religious Jews believed that Messiah would be the Son of God. That is a very interesting point. We don't know if these educated clergy believe that Messiah would be the Son of God by nature and eternal generation, or only by some kind of special adoption, such as happened with the Jewish nation. Yet when Jesus acknowledged that he was both the Messiah and the Son of God, they rejected his claim. Why did they do this? Matthew chapter 27, verse 18 gives us one reason. 
for Pilate knew that it was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. Another reason began before they arrested Jesus, and we see this in John chapter 11, verses 49 through 52. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. Their thought was that Jesus could possibly bring down the wrath of Rome upon the nation if he was declared the rightful king of Israel. I would also add another possibility that isn't directly stated in Scripture, but is true to the world in which we live. These men were instruments of demons, being driven by Satan to have Jesus arrested and murdered. If this was the case, which I strongly believe that it was, then they were ignorant of the demonic power that was manipulating them. Just as the Sanhedrin manipulated Pilate to crucify Jesus, so demons were manipulating them to put into motion the most horrendous crime ever committed, to murder God incarnate. Yet what they meant for evil, the Lord turned for the salvation of all those who put their faith in Christ and turned from their sin through genuine repentance. Jesus replied to them, You are right in saying I am. This is what the corrupt elders of Israel was wanting, a way to condemn Jesus to death by the accusation that he was a blasphemer by claiming equality with the Father. Though there was nothing false in what Jesus said since he spoke the absolute truth, these religious men didn't care for the truth, but only their dead religion and worthless traditions. They loved being in power and wanted to retain that power at all costs. Their response to the Savior's confession is seen in verse 71. Then they said, Why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. The testimony that should have brought them to bow to Christ in homage and worship instead manifested their horribly corrupt spiritual condition. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 65 and 66, we are told, Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. They are acting like a bunch of rabid wolves that were foaming at the mouth as they began tearing apart their victim. This is a picture of men inflamed by demons that are insanely acting out the demon's will. Jesus had never sinned not even once, and he was the most loving man this world has ever known. He spent himself showing compassion to the multitudes by relieving their suffering and teaching them how to enter the kingdom of God. The Pharisees had never done anything that was good for the multitudes of Israel. They didn't relieve their suffering or teach them the way to know God in a personal way. What the high priest said helped to manifest the vicious characters that were lying beneath the deceptive religious facade the Pharisees, Sadducees, and chief priests kept hidden from the people. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 67 and 68, we are told, Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you? We learn from this why these elders of Israel didn't reprove the temple guard for beating Jesus before the Sanhedrin met to try him. That same evil, violent, angry heart and mind that was burning against Jesus in the temple soldiers was also raging in the religious rulers. The picture we are commonly given is that a few of the prominent Pharisees took Jesus to Pilate and laid before him the crimes Jesus supposedly committed. In the first verse of Luke 23, we are given the correct story. Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. In that sham trial, there would have been the Sanhedrin, which consisted of 70 elders of Israel. There would have been some of the temple guard among them, and some Pharisees, priests, and lawyers, some of which weren't on the council. This means that the crowd was over 70 people with all of them being prominent Jewish leaders, and they were all taking G's to Pilate. Given that the entire Sanhedrin went to Pilate would have elevated the issue in his mind, and that's exactly what those religious rulers wanted. 
if it was just a few of them from the council, the procurator could have ignored them or just chose not to get involved in their religious matters. But being that the entire Sanhedrin was involved in this matter, and given that it was just before the beginning of the Jewish Passover, Pilate didn't want to provoke any riots or some other kind of disturbance. In verse 2, we are told what happened next. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Christ, a king. We know all those accusations were lies, and they knew it as well. When people have a low view of God and a high view of self, they don't see lying as really lying. They don't think it a bad thing. To them, the end justifies the means. So if they had to lie to get Jesus executed, then they thought that it was better to lie and have an innocent man murdered in a very agonizing way than for them to lose their position and power. When religion is perverted, it becomes very evil and very ugly. Yet those caught up in such deep deception can't see how wicked they are or how they are being used by devils. Their willful deception is leading them to hell, but they can't see this either or comprehend that their sin and rebellion has blinded them so that they can't see the truth and be saved. The three accusations they brought to Pilate about Jesus were given to incite the procurator's anger so that he would quickly and brutally deal with Jesus. Though Pilate was an ungodly man, he saw through their religious jealousy and hypocrisy and their weak accusations against Jesus. The first accusation was subverting the Jewish nation. Pilate was sent by Rome to maintain the peace in that conquered land. Any honest person investigating Jesus and his message would soon learn that there was absolutely nothing he taught that related to the overthrow of Rome or the Herod dynasty. The second charge against Jesus was that he was inciting people to not pay their taxes to Rome, which was a typical idea among the zealots. Jesus told one of their own religious leaders that the people were to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. The Lord never told the people not to pay taxes. Then you have the account where Jesus sent Peter out one day to go fishing and told him that in the mouth of the first fish he caught would be a coin, and with that he could pay their taxes. That account is found at the end of Matthew chapter 17. The third accusation is that Jesus claimed to be king, and this was probably deduced from our Lord's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which the religious Jews were appalled at and infuriated over. They also probably deduced this from Jesus' claim to be Messiah. Even before Pilate, Jesus proclaimed that he was a king, not of this world, but of the kingdom of heaven, and the procurator wasn't threatened by our Lord's statement. Now this is the only accusation that has any truth to it, but the religious Jews twisted it to make it look as if Jesus was gathering an army to fight against Rome. In verse 3, Pilate answered Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. We know that Pilate had at least a couple of private interviews with Jesus. This dialogue seemed to have happened away from the conniving Sanhedrin. We read in John chapter 18, verses 36 and 37, that Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. In the very next verse, Pilate sarcastically asked, What is truth? What Jesus said to the governor so convinced him that we see in Luke chapter 23, verse 4, that Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. Years later, Pilate committed suicide. We can't say why he killed himself, but I would imagine his being an integral part of killing Jesus, whom he knew was innocent of any crime, was part of it. Here you have a pagan idol worshiper being more honest than those who are supposed to be God's chosen people. In response, the religious Jews insisted in verse 5, He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. This was true, but those conniving men twisted what Jesus was doing. Yes, he was stirring up the people, 
but to what end? To the saving of their souls, their deliverance from demons, the healing of their bodies, and the feeding of multitudes. Jesus was the scariest person on the planet because he was God incarnate, but he was also the most loving and compassionate man this world has ever known. From what the Jews said about Jesus starting his ministry in Galilee, we are told in Luke chapter 23, verse 6, on hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. Pilate showed himself a weak leader through his dealings with Jesus. The governor saw this as a possible way to get this nasty business of killing an innocent man out of his hair, and especially since this man claimed to be a king. In verse 7 we read, When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. Herod Antipas, though he wasn't of Jewish descent, professed to be Jewish and to conform to Judaism. This would have brought him to Jerusalem for the Passover. Pilate was also in Jerusalem for the Passover, not as a worshiper, but to be on hand in case any expression of unrest happened and he could be on hand to deal with the problem. Pilate usually lived in Caesarea and Herod in Tiberias. Rather than being angry at Pilate for sending over to him this troublesome problem, we are told in verse 8, When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased, because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform some miracle. Herod wasn't a follower of the Lord God, nor was he interested in becoming a follower of Jesus. He was Jewish in name only to appease the people he governed. The man wanted Jesus to perform a magic trick. He wanted Jesus to entertain him for a few minutes, but he didn't want to know Christ's teaching or anything else about him. We see that Jesus' fame had reached the palace and the Tetrarch, which is only to be expected since Herod wanted to keep the rule he was given by his father, with the approval of Rome, of course. The large crowd Jesus was drawing would get rulers a little nervous, to say the least. Yet there was nothing wrong with what he was doing. The Lord was on a mission of mercy, not raising an army to fight against the powers that be. Then in verse 9 we are told that Herod plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. Time was of the essence, and it was slipping by quickly. Jesus wasn't worried or anxious, since this event had been planned before creation came into existence. He just refused to respond to Herod's questions since the mission at hand was to be the Lamb of God. While Herod was plying Jesus with questions, in verse 10 we are told that the chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. My guess is that our Lord's silence infuriated the corrupt religious leaders. Herod was probably angry because he wasn't entertained by Jesus and didn't get his way, as was usually the case. The response to Jesus' silence we find in verse 11. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed him and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. It doesn't say that they beat Jesus, for he must have been bruised and bloody from the abuse he received from the religious elite. We are only told that Herod and some soldiers mocked him and dressed him in an elegant robe since one of the accusations was that he was the king of the Jews. Herod sent Jesus back to Pilate, and verse 12 informs us, That day Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. How ironic! These two enemies of Christ were reconciled to each other through the Prince of Peace, whom they were mocking and abusing. If enemies of Christ can be reconciled to each other because of Jesus, how much more should those who are Christ's followers be reconciled to fellow believers? I know of a teaching ministry that focuses on family issues, but the children totally cut off their mother, yet they claim to be Christian and teach on family matters. The mother died alone, without her children, because they all refused to be reconciled to their mother before she died. Enemies of Christ were reconciled to each other through Jesus, yet those who claim to be his friends can't be reconciled to their mother. What's wrong with this picture? What does it say about a ministry that focuses on family issues but refuses to act like a Christian family should? Of course, I don't know all the issues that brought about the strife and separation. But if we can't solve our problems as Christians, the world won't be impressed with us.
Until we live out the truth, why should the world listen to us, even when we say that we have the answers to life, but don't prove it through our actions? The world might begin listening to us when we live out 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Sweet Jesus, help us to live out what true love is to the fullest. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. Thirst no more, so come wash in the river, come drink your fill, let healing waters bear away your gift.